Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Ben and I am an alcoholic. Yeah. All right. Let the healing begin. <laughs> I, I'm English by birth. I'm Irish by disease. I'm Scotch by absorption, and I'm American by adoption. And some smart-ass Irishman's going to come up to me after the meeting and object to me <laughs> allying this racial problem with the disease of alcoholism, and I'll say the same to that one as I have to several others. Tough shit. <laughs> I, I've been praying just this last couple of moments that I don't forget to say thank you to some people, and, and I want to say thank you to Erin for organizing this whole thing, and to Phil and Chris who invited me up here, and uh, Eddie and Jean, who looked after us so well this weekend and have ferried us around, and some old friends of mine haven't seen for a long time, David and Adrian and Dean here, <laughs> my buddy, <laughs> and Phil from Reading, some great people, and I just want to, you know, renew those, those old friendships. It's a wonderful thing about AA conferences. And the other thing I've been praying frantically about is that I don't use the F word this morning. Uh, I, I know that there is no tradition about cleaning up our language in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, the big book tells me that we describe spirituality in everyday language. So if you don't like it, screw you. Uh, but I don't want to use the F word, and I'll tell you why. It's just real practical, because I was speaking at a, a Christmas meeting a couple of years ago, and I, and I used the F word, and I, it, it didn't sit quite right, but it sort of described what I was talking about. And right after I'd spoken, the chairman of the meeting came up and asked if anybody owned a black Jaguar. Well, I just happened to own a black Jaguar at that time. And, and I wondered why he was asking, but a tree had fallen on it, you see. <laughs> and, and I'm very worried that if I use the F word, a tree might fall on that 737 we're going home in. <laughs> That's the only reason. So I'm just uh, trying to clean it up and give you a message of hope. A little bit of hope, anyway. Wasn't Edie wonderful? I love that lady. Oh, God. I laughed and I cried, and uh, then I wondered if I'd have anything to say. <laughs> but uh, we can trust. <laughs> I'm a shy, retiring, sensitive alcoholic. <laughs> I, I want you to know that, that I, I'm, I'm a high-bottom drunk. It, it's very important. Uh, in, in, in Grants Pass, Oregon, you don't get too many of them, I've noticed. Uh, and Phil said something to me before the meeting. He said, God, you look good. And I said, yeah, i got to get the suit back by 2 o'clock. But no, really, I am a high-bottom drunk. It, it, and it's important because there are newcomers here, and, and they don't really know the... The, the pecking order in Alcoholics Anonymous, you see. Uh, and, and it's, I'm a high bottom drunk because I took my last drink on the fourth floor of a maximum security penitentiary. <laughs> and that's where I got status, and that's where I got sober. <laughs> um, I haven't had a drink by the grace of God, program of Alcoholics Anonymous, meetings like this, people like you, and a little bit of action on my part since December the 12th, 1970. And wow! 9,275 days. <laughs> and I haven't taken anything, I haven't poured anything down my throat, stuck anything up my nose, in my ears, in my arm, or up my ass, that had changed my mind. 
And if you have a different definition of sobriety, I feel sorry for you. And there will be those of you who are taking some of that non-habit forming shit who tell me that it's prescribed by a doctor so it's okay. And that may be okay for you. But I want to tell you, I hope you live long enough to sponsor some doctors. Because <laughs> I sponsor doctors and I sponsor a psychiatrist and a couple of therapists and in the cold night of the soul when they're telling me their fifth steps, you'll have a different view of what's okay written on a prescription. And I'm just saying that for two reasons. One is that I don't ever want to take anything. And if I don't have a strong position about non-habit forming shit, I might get to take some myself. And also there may be somebody out there who's just wondering about that antidepressant shit. And I want to tell you, you don't have to take it. You just don't have to take it. And if you look around and see the people who are taking it, they're all so depressed. <laughs> they're such a terrible advertisement for the stuff they're taking. Anyway, let's get off that and uh, get on and talk about alcoholism, which that's part of, I suppose, and recovery and all this good stuff. And... It's May in Grants Pass, Oregon. <laughs> Wonderful. I've got to tell you, I drank. I, I do not come from the school who wants to talk just about recovery. Because uh, my sobriety is unimpressive even to me if I don't tell you that I drank. <laughs> you know, I know people who've been sober longer than me, and uh, their sobriety doesn't impress me at all. Because they didn't drink like me. I drank anything I could get my hands on. I drank for England. I want to impress you. I, I, I drank, for, I was on the international team. <laughs> Didn't get a lot of recognition for it. But uh, it was one of the reasons I never wanted to come to America. Uh, I want to tell you this, it may offend some of you. But uh, I, I didn't ever want to come to America because you drank so badly. A couple of reasons. It seems that you didn't have a stomach for liquor. And two, you have a quantity problem. And I, I was many years sober before I understood the problem that I'd had. I've been drinking 20 ounce pints for the whole of my drinking career. And you guys have been getting away with 16 ounce pints. Now that's a big handicap for a guy like me, but I overcame it. I overcame it. I drank those big pints. And I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I drank a lot. I, I do not come from a deprived background. I, I owned three racehorses when I was 18. Uh, I, I want to tell you about that because I used to be a skinny little kid and I was a coward. It's very important to tell you I was a coward. I've gone a lot better since I've been telling meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous when I'm frightened. And uh, one day I told you I was a coward, and, and it got better after that. It's amazing how, it's like a, a sort of measure of our spiritual well-being is how early in the day we laugh at ourselves. I want to tell you how early the, today that I laughed at me. You will not notice, but I am wearing identical colored gray socks, but one is longer than the other. And, uh, and I said to Prudence, I, I don't know about this, will they notice? <laughs> and she said, I'm not sure. And I was worried you'd laugh at me, so I had to tell you so we can laugh together. <laughs> I was such a coward that uh, I had to do something about it. I was so afraid that I had to do something about it. I did not like the discipline at home. Um, I come from a family, and I have no idea whether it was dysfunctional, because I have nothing to judge it by. And so I'm not going to complain about the dysfunctional family I was brought up in. I'm going to tell you and take responsibility for two dysfunctional families that I am the co-founder of. <laughs> And by doing this, we get well. 
This may shock you and some people may want to leave, but this is not therapy we're indulging in. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. And we take responsibility for what we do and we quit complaining about what happened to us. Wow. That may not be popular. <laughs> so, what did I do? I, I didn't like the discipline at home and so I went to the English equivalent of West Point to become an officer and a gentleman in the British Army. A place called Sandhurst. Uh, it's uh, famous for a few of its old inhabitants. Winston Churchill, David Niven and I. Three great alcoholics. And uh, I looked around and uh, I saw people who were not afraid. And I thought the answer is to do what people who are not afraid do. Because I don't like being afraid. Now, I did not sit down with paper and pencil and take a written tenth step on this. I... I just saw that I was brought up, as I say, with racehorses, and uh, I was a skinny little kid, and uh, the people who didn't seem to be affected by fear were steeplechase jockeys. And I knew quite a few of them, and so I became one. And uh, it's, a, it's a very scary sport. I, I went out there on the track, and I, I broke myself up pretty bad a few times, and uh, I overcame the fear. Somewhat, until it sort of, uh, it overcame me. But what happened, I, I want to share with you a day, I was 19 years old and we had a little horse that uh, we bought out of France and uh, we, we ran it at this race meeting and uh, and I rode it and, uh, and it won and it, the tote paid 34 to 1 that afternoon and and I had more money than, than I'd ever seen before. And after we'd collected the money, they wanted to, they, they wanted me in the middle of the winner's circle. And, and I went out there and, and there were some television cameras on and I, I, I got to receive this cup and the person who gave it to me was the Queen of England. And I was 19 years old and I was a shy little kid from the country and I had arrived. I had arrived, and I walked back into the changing room, and I changed opposite Fergie's dad. It was <laughs> amazing, long time before she was born. But uh, I was in high company that day, and uh, I did a little bit of inventory as I sat there pulling my boots off, and uh, nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. I'd planned this for two years, and... Uh, I'd gone through every fence we were going to jump and everything and I'd planned it and it had come off just like that and nothing had changed and I'd still got that hollow feeling in my stomach and uh, I never gave anything my best shot from that moment until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, I got a call from my baby sister a couple of years ago and, and, and they ran the, mo the movie, the newsreel of that race 40 years later, and she'd just been watching it on television, and, and she called me up, and, and, and I thought, wow, you know, if they'd run that movie every day for 40 years, it wouldn't have been enough. There is not enough for a guy of my type. They issued me with a dictionary before I got a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the dictionary missed that one word, enough. And when you don't have the word enough, the meaning of all the other words changes. And uh, booze was beautiful. I've got to share with you, I loved booze. Because, you see, it did for me. Now, the non-alcoholics, the people out there who are not needing to come to us, booze has never done anything for them. And if it never did anything for me, I'd have never let it do anything to me twice. The first time I had a hangover, if it hadn't done anything for me, I'd have said, let's cut that stuff out. But, but I couldn't, because it promised everything there was. It promised life for me. And uh, it was so insidious. It didn't get me badly the first time. It just made it better. 
And I'd been brought up around booze, and uh, when I was 13, on my 13th birthday, I was given a silver flask. And uh, it was a half pint, real half pint. Because we went fox hunting in the winter. That's what we did in my family. And uh, may tell you a little bit about my dad, because we're going to talk about him a little bit. When I was about six, I had a Shetland pony, and, uh, and the Shetland pony stumbled one day, and I came straight over the front, and uh, I cut my face just a little bit, my hands quite a lot, and the li little Shetland pony called Bunty had a piece of blood, a bubble of blood on its knee about as big as my pinky nail, and my dad said, go and get the iodine. I went and got the iodine. It was for the pony. That's how I got brought up. About, I don't know, 15 years later, I'm laying on a racetrack. And uh, I, I'd been kicked by, I'd been in the lead when this horse fell. And uh, I had a broken collarbone and a broken nose and a, a mouth full of dirt and grass. And I, I was not happy. It was raining and, oh, mother, and the drink dried out of me too. You know, and I looked up and there's my dad chasing the horse down the track and he's coming past me, big tall man swinging a pair of large race glasses in his hand and he shouted out at me as he went past, you'll be all right, boy. I was all right. I wasn't going anywhere. That's, that's the relationship we had and, uh, and I'm not complaining about it because I perpetuated that relationship and, uh, and it's, it's now different, but uh, there we are. Um, I drank. I was an officer in the British Army, and I, I drank for England, as I said, and uh, I got into trouble. I, I used to have trouble balancing my checkbook. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a social climber. I want to, I want to tell you that. I, I'm not really shy and retiring. I, I've always wanted to be one more than I am, one better than I am. I'll tell you who I know even if I don't really know them, but if I knew a friend of theirs, I'd lie to you about it. And, and I have a little caveat that I want to put in at this time, is, and that is that if there is anything in my pitch this morning that makes me look good or impresses you, it is either a lie or an exaggeration. <laughs> so if we can get that out of the way... Um, you know, I do lie and exaggerate to this day. It's, <laughs> you know, I, mean, God, what? I used to tell this tale, and it, if anybody is going to take notes, forget <laughs> it, because there's no sequence here. The, it, I just can't get it in sequence. I, I came here very badly damaged. My, my brain was not working well, and so I can't get it in a sequence. I try and tell you I got sober, and and then just talk, and then when more of you are leaving than are coming in, then we quit. <laughs> that's how it works. Or when they run out of tape. I mean, I quit talking. As soon as they run out of tape, I'm done. <laughs> Egomaniac of my type. I have all the requirements to be a circuit speaker. I will drive a thousand miles to speak when I have difficulty crossing the road to listen. My home group is uh, the Big Box Study Group at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. They just started. They're in session right now. It's on Buchanan and Geary in San Francisco. And it is adjoining the condominium complex where we live. I mean, I do not have to cross a public road to get there. I am a trusted servant of that group, and I cannot get there one minute early. Now, if I'm speaking out of town, I'll be there 35, 40 minutes early. I don't want anything to go wrong. I'll do all that stuff. It, other people do it too. But I want to tell you, I'm that sort of flake. I'm that sort of flake. Um, some remarkable things happened to me in the penitentiary, and I, I'll tell you about these, and we'll just wander on through sobriety this morning, and, and then we'll probably talk about the steps, and if any of you are left, we'll talk about the traditions. Uh, 
And then maybe some, you know, there might be one or two left, we'll talk about the contents. <laughs> but they arrested me. Strange, isn't it? I, I was living full-time crime because uh, I couldn't go to work. Uh, that may have happened to some of you, I don't know, but it happened to me. I could not cross the sidewalk to get my company car to drive to the office one Monday morning. It was just impossible. I mean, I'd done all the right things. I know about the right things. You don't have to tell me, did you have a drink? Yes, I had a drink. I mean, I know about that shit. I know about taking the bottle to the bathroom. Do not waste it out here because otherwise you're going to throw up on the carpet. So I'd take the bottle to the bathroom. I'd had one drink, thrown it up, two drinks, thrown it up. Third drink, it stayed down, but it didn't work well. Well, didn't say it didn't work. Now, it's very important that I get to you my judgment about drinking. Every time I was faced with the question of whether to take a drink or not, I made the right decision because it was always better to take the drink than to not take the drink. I hear people saying it stopped working. It may have stopped working, but it was always better than not taking it. Always. Otherwise, why take it? I mean, I'm not dumb. I'm an alcoholic. It always worked. That particular morning, I could not cross the sidewalk, couldn't get in the car, went to the doctor, got a medical certificate, forwarded it to the company, did all that stuff, I'm not dumb. I took a few weeks off. What had happened on the Friday before was just a little preparation for this. I'd been to the secretary of the company, and I'd got the registration documents for that company car. I don't know why. He didn't know why. I just said, give them to me. I'm a senior executive with a construction company, that was quoted on the big board of the London Stock Exchange. I, I was a, an okay guy, you know. I mean, I wore a suit in those days. I got the documents, put them in my pocket. I discovered why I needed them. About four weeks later, I had to sell the car. Very important stuff. Difficult to sell if you don't have the documents. Be prepared. That's the Boy Scouts marching song. I was always be prepared. They were looking for us, and I've got to tell you that I had a buddy. Well, it, it, let's put it this way. This may sound sexist, and it probably is, but I had a wife one side of town and a mistress the other. Now, that sounds sexist, but we'll wander on from there. There were, there were several pubs in between, and I used to travel backwards and forwards. Now... Once I got turned around halfway and got back home with a good excuse to be away for three days. I didn't do that again. <laughs> but the girlfriend who I called mistress, and we'll work on that in a little while, she came to me and she said, the police are looking for us. Now, that's always bad news. It's always bad news. I did not ask why. I said, we better leave town. And we left town. We got out of town, and we pulled into the first pub on the left-hand side of the road. Now, I've got some advice. There are going to be some people here who drink again, and I, I need to give you advice. This is the only advice you'll get this morning. You'll get a lot of opinion and shoulds and musts, but this is advice. When you drink again, always drink on the same side of the road that you drive. Crossing oncoming traffic on your way to the first drink of the day is suicide. <laughs> now, we drive on the left-hand side of the road, and I want to put to rest once and for all, publicly, why that is the correct way to go. <laughs> Have you ever thought what it was like in Dodge City, Back in the days when you were riding a horse and you were riding on the right-hand side of the Main Street, Dodge City, and a bad hombre is coming the other way, and you take your gun out to shoot him, he takes his gun out to shoot you, 
and you both shoot your horses in the head. <laughs> now, where I come from, we ride on the left-hand side of the road, and we deal with swords and lances or guns, and we get the other person. We don't shoot our own horse in the head. Now, I mean, this is meaningless, and it will not change any traffic problems in the States, but I want to tell you that we are right. <laughs> now, this is always so important to me, is to be right. Anyway, we had pulled into the pub car arc on the left-hand side of the road. We're having a drink. We're reading the racing paper. We'd been to the bank beforehand. We, in fact, we'd been to several banks, because I always had more bank accounts than money. And so we'd cashed a lot of checks before we left town, and I said to her, her name is Gwen, some of you know her, and uh, she was a drinking young woman at that time, and uh, I said to her, we don't have enough money, we'd better go to the races. So we went to the races, and it was one of those days when everything sort of fell into place. I, I backed one of these triellas, you know, three horses and a accumulator, and I watched from the bar the third horse win, and we had a lot of money. I mean, couldn't count the money. As we're leaving the racetrack, it's coming out of pocket, she's trying to count it, she says to hell with it, we've got plenty. We stopped in a hotel that night, we were on our way to the Welsh mountains to hide out from the police. Now, we don't know why they're looking for us, I, I want to repeat that, we don't know why they're looking for us, but we're running away. And her father owns a hotel in the Welsh mountains near Snowdon, and it sounded sort of romantic to run away, like the book 39 Steps. I don't know whether you remember that. But anyway, we were, that's where we were going to. But we'd gone to the races, and then we ended up in London. It, a bit like going to Boise, you know. <laughs> I think he's gone back to Boise. <laughs> so... She books us a hotel room in London, and I said, you'd better use somebody else's name just in case. Now, we've got a stack of folding money. But when we left that hotel, five, six days later, I don't know, ran out of time, memory, and money, we come down an iron ladder at the back of one of these five-star hotels, in London, where they de they're delivering the goods in the morning, and we are coming down the ladder at the back into the little lane, the muse at the back. And that's why we used the wrong name. But it didn't matter, because we went on doing this, and we got confused. And we'd write my name in your checkbook, and your name in my checkbook, and we'd stay at different hotels, and we did all this stuff. And one day, they arrested us. And... Uh, it was the end of the line, I thought, you know, the worst day of my life. He called for Mr. Jackson on the um, public address. Now, my name is not Jackson. It's Wilson, spelled W-I-L-S-O-N. I heard somebody, when, when Edie was mentioning my last name, saying something about breaking anonymity. That's not breaking anonymity, that's talking about another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've given her my permission to use that name. I've given you permission to use my last name. But not at the level of press, radio, and films. And, uh, and that's where we have anonymity. I go visiting some anonymous member of Alcoholics Anonymous in a hospital, I have to break his anonymity to find out who he is. He hasn't told me his last name, and I'm looking for Pete P. And they say, we don't have a Pete P. And I say, well, he belongs to my group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Or something, you know. I mean, how do I get to see him? And they say, oh, he's a drunk. Yeah, we'll find him. <laughs> I also give you that name because it's in the, in the, I nearly said the London Telephone Directory. Have an identity crisis. It's in the San Francisco Telephone Directory. There were two Ben Wilsons for a long time. The other guy couldn't stand the heat. <laughs> Somebody from out of town called him. 
And he said, 9319555 and hung up. He knows my number better than I do. <laughs> he has gone ex-directory or whatever you call it here. I've been unlisted, thank you. Yeah, I need an interpreter. I, <laughs> I have a problem with the language a lot. So, where are we? We're, <laughs> we're on our way to Alcoholics Anonymous. We're getting arrested in the Royal Oxford Hotel. The man asked for Mr. Jackson. I said, hang on, honey. I went out there, two men with shiny shoes. The detectives in England, it took them a long time to realize that if they were going undercover, they had to wear dirty shoes. Because you'd see them with <laughs> awful old jeans and a sweatshirt on and highly polished shoes. <laughs> I could spot them walking into the pub. <laughs> And, and he, he asked me if I was who I am, and, and really my name is Rodney David Wilson, and he had a badge, and he asked me if, and I said yes. He said, go and get the young woman out of the restaurant, he said, and don't try ranking a run through the kitchen, we've got somebody there, he said, but don't make a fuss. I went to the table, and we had done, you know the first things first slogan? Do you know what that means? That means, what food goes with this wine? And we had ordered a bottle of wine each, because that's the way we did it. And uh, there was about half a bottle left, and so I drank that, and then went out to get arrested. Um, I, it's time to tell you about social drinking just for a moment. Uh, I digress a little bit, because my mind is badly fractured. Uh, it's a, a disease of broken gauges, this... Um, uh, <laughs> I want to tell you about social drinking because there are people who've just got here from therapy who really want to be social drinkers so badly. <laughs> I mean, they just want to be social drinkers. <laughs> and it's sad. It's really sad because there is nothing so obnoxious as social drinking. I, I mean, you know, I, give me a drunk of my type, you know, a guy who's got one in each hand and a bottle in his hip pocket and going for broke. That's the guy. You know, I used to take the cork out of the bottle, throw it in the fireplace, and say, we shan't be needing that. <laughs> but a social drinker, you know, they, they were out on Friday. They're always out on Friday, social drinkers. And the one I want to tell you about, he left the office at 4.35. Everybody else had gone at 4.30. He's the guy who locks up, you know. He's the guy who's going to make vice president. The alcoholic had not shown up that morning, because it was Friday. But our social drinker drives home past 15 or 20 bars. The car does not swerve, just straight home. He gets home, showers, shaves, changes, without benefit of alcohol. Already, this is a sad story. <laughs> he goes out to dinner. The table is not ready, so they go into the bar. They order two highballs. Half finished, maitre d' comes in, calls them to their table. They leave the half finished highball on the bar. Now there's a mistake. <laughs> go into dinner, order a bottle of wine between them. They do not understand the mathematics of alcoholism. You wait until everybody else has chosen, and then you have the opposite color. Three of you drinking white wine, I drink red. I get a whole bottle to myself. The worst that can happen in this calculation is I get my fair share. The best that can happen is I'm three to one better off. Anyway, they share a bottle of wine, and because it's Friday night, they have a glass of brandy. And then he takes his own wife home. <laughs> now that's not the sad part of it. The sad part is that he got bad breath and a headache and he never got downtown. <laughs> and that's what some of you newcomers want to be restored to. It's outrageous. Share with you about the steps, because we're going to talk about the steps in just a minute. If I came to you this morning, and I've threatened to do this, 
with the formula for how to turn water into Jack Daniel's whiskey for five cents a gallon and told you that it had 12 procedural steps. Outcome pens, notebooks. <laughs> Halfway through, could you repeat the quantity? <laughs> Is it all right to boil it for 19 minutes as opposed to 20? All sorts of really spiritual questions. And then we mention, just casually mention, that there are 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know what you say, because it's what I say. Immediately I hear them, I say, what can I leave out? They promised it will save my life, restore me to sanity, and I say, what can I leave out? Now, if I was doing the water into Jack Daniel's whiskey, the 12th step you can leave out there, because it says mature in an oaken cask for seven years. You know you can cut that out. But here we are, dying. And we say, what can I leave out? I'm talking to a guy on the sidewalk the other day, and he said, I gave him my card, and he said, I was at this meeting, he said, nine years ago. I said, oh? He said, you gave me the same card nine years ago. I said, that's right, probably did. And we get into this conversation, and he's a newcomer again. And so I talked to him about uh, getting on with the steps. And, and he said, I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> well, I know where he heard that shit. I mean, that's got to have come from therapy. I mean, we didn't say comfortable in the bars. I mean, where can you get that word? But I explained to him about comfort. I said to him thus, the last time I was comfortable, I said I was sitting on a bar stool with my back to the wall, facing the door. I had six drinks in a row and the change from a hundred on the bar. Now that's comfortable. Now, it's not going to be comfortable facing people who you owe money to. It's not going to be comfortable making amends. There's certainly going to be very little comfort in your fourth step. But you're going to die if you don't do it. And this is where our mind, this mind that has gauges broken, and maybe I ought to explain about the broken gauges. You see, I shivered on hot days. Gives you a clue that the mechanism wasn't working right. I sweated in the winter. Something wrong with the thermostat. I am there in a bar... I have just overflowed at both ends, and I say to the bartender, fill me up, Jack. There's something wrong with the capacity gauge. I am broken. And yet I say at an AA meeting when I am relatively new, I think, luckily, the sponsor was there. I got this sponsor, I'm going to talk about him, and then we'll get into the steps. It might be a good way to get into the steps to talk about the sponsor, mightn't it? A man called Paul Shainer from Tulsa, Oklahoma, happened to live in London, England, when I was at the turning point of my life. Sober a year or two, and uh, I walk into a meeting, and he's the speaker. Now, I am sort of inappropriate in a way in that I, I've, I've dressed for downtown London this morning because it's the only thing I know how to do, right? Dino told me to buy cowboy boots, but I couldn't really hack it. Anyway, Paul is wearing a bootlace tie, a plaid jacket, and cowboy boots, and he's speaking at a meeting with, within less than half a mile of Big Ben. He's inappropriately dressed. I could tell he was a foreigner. And then he talked weird. I mean, he talked really weird. <laughs> he said thus. He said, this afternoon I hit a golf ball 300 yards, made love to five women, and was made president of my corporation. And then he shut up. He stopped talking, and then he went all right up here. And I went, wow, I got to know this guy. He thinks like I think. 
Now, this guy is not my full-time sponsor today because he lives in Fayetteville, Arkansas. But he still loves me more than I love me, and he still calls me, and I, ha I have a sponsor in San Francisco, and I have had for the last 12 years. I, I believe in having a sponsor who has the same postal sort of address, generally speaking. Certainly the same, same area code as I have. It, it, it's sort of better, because he gets to see me, you know. I mean, I can fake a lot of stuff. But uh, I, I got to work with this guy a little bit, and, and I learned sponsor talk. I didn't understand what he was doing. And, and I, I learned, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I would talk to him on the telephone, and all I'd get was, uh-huh. And I didn't realize what he was doing until I'm sitting in his office. He's talking to somebody else he sponsors. He's going, uh-huh. And he's checking drilling reports. He's the head of exploration of one of the largest oil companies in the world. And he's checking drilling reports and going, uh-huh. It's sponsor talk. People say to you, how can you sponsor all those people? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It says in this book, wherever it is, it says, listen to them. Doesn't mean you have to take notes. <laughs> and he said to me one day when I said, I think, he said, I don't care what you think and I don't give a shit what you feel. Tell me what are you doing? And this man has changed my life. He has worked the steps with me. He's shown me how to work the steps with other people. And his lack of education, what I'm talking about is he's never been to sponsorship store. So I said he's head of exploration of one of the largest oil companies in the world. He's very bright. But he's never been to sponsorship store. He doesn't understand my feelings. He, he has no consideration for my inner child, I'll tell you that. <laughs> We're on step nine one day, and he said to me, you've misread it. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're doing whenever. And I know half the people in AA are doing whenever, because I hear them read it, and they do whenever. You can't do step nine with whenever. He said, it's wherever. Oh, okay. And he said to me, you're too arrogant to send these people a dollar each, aren't you? And I said, Paul, I've been explaining how many zeros there are. I cannot possibly. He said, I told you you were too arrogant to send them a dollar each. He said, can you send them ten dollars each? I said, yes, just about. And he said, this is the letter you will enclose with a check for ten dollars to each of these people. He said, you will say... In the letter, here is a very small percentage of the amount owed, but a very large percentage of the available funds. Let them worry, you get on with the program. That's down-to-earth stuff, isn't it? Anyway, we'll, get, we'll start with the steps, because uh, this is what I came here for today. There's somebody who doesn't believe they can sponsor people, and their life depends on it. And I want to tell you how easy it is to sponsor people. I want to tell you that if you're listening to people who tell you how difficult the fourth step is, you're listening to people who ain't done it. Anybody who says the fourth step is difficult has not done it like it says here. If you've done it like it says here, you will be so overjoyed you cannot stop passing it on. So, here is how I do it. And the experience that I have is that we start at step three. Now, this may seem Irish to some of you. <laughs> but I have good grounds for this. It says right after the third step prayer, it says, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties. But well before taking this step. In any other educational discipline, it would have that caveat before the step, before the prayer. It would say, think well before proceeding. But when they wrote this, they were alcoholic, we are alcoholic, they know what they're talking about. We didn't know we'd thought well until after we'd said the prayer. 
No, we know what we're doing. We've said the prayer. We're in God's grace. Let's do steps one and two. Because I did step one in a bar. Some people did it in the closet. I did it in trains, planes, cars, living rooms, whorehouses, all sorts of places. I went into a bar for two drinks, came out 22 drinks later. I never once said, I'm very I'm an alcoholic and I'm a member of a 12-step program. I just said, hit me again, Jack. Every time I said, hit me again, Jack, after I'd had more drinks than I had planned to have, I admitted I was powerless over alcohol. I've told you I took my last drink on the fourth floor of a maximum security penitentiary. My life would become unmanageable. I've taken step one. I don't have to do it any better than that except to share it with people who are new. Now, I did that bar thing hundreds of times. I drove drunk hundreds of times, thousands of times, etc., etc. But what? If you've done it once, you're in. If you've had a blackout, you're in. You don't have to have any more blackouts than one blackout. And if you haven't had blackouts, it doesn't exclude you. That's a bitch, isn't it? <laughs> I love this thing about definitions, you know, because I was looking for a definition of an alcoholic. And somebody said, we don't deal in definitions, we deal in descriptions. I'm a description, I'm not a definition. So step two. Everybody's taking it this morning. Everybody's taking step two who's got through the doors of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We came to listen, which is coming to believe that the power of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is greater than the power of the individual, can restore us to sanity dependent upon the working of the next ten steps. I believe my understanding of sanity is that uh, I don't drink whatever happens. That's sanity. I have not been relieved of craziness. <laughs> I have been restored to sanity. On the bottom of page 63 where it says, it, it, where it gives the third step prayer, the first word of the last sentence is next. It is one of the very few words in the English language that cannot be misinterpreted. <laughs> it does not mean when you come back from the bathroom, when you return from vacation, when your sponsor says you're ready, it means next. <laughs> On the next page it says that though this was a crucial step talking about the third step, it could have little lasting effect unless at once followed by. At once is one nanosecond slower than next. <laughs> and we move on into this step of making some lists, and they're real simple. They're really simple. I don't want this to sound like a lecture. But there may be somebody who doesn't understand there's maybe somebody who thinks that the resentments start on page 65 and they can't understand that chart. And on page 64 it says we listed people, institutions and principles with whom we were angry. And if you don't do that, you can't do the chart on page 65. It's like trying to rebuild the engine of a car and missing the first instruction. Because you've got the instructions there and it says, number one, pop the hood. Now, if you don't pop the hood, you can't get the spark plugs out. It's just the same with the inventory. If we go past one instruction without following it, the minds go to jello. They cannot absorb anything. And so if we don't list these people, institutions and principles with whom we're angry, we can't move along. And I get people going and I have a little trick, I have one trick. One piece of ego that I absolutely insist on. I get people to buy a green 8.5 by 11 spiral bound notebook to write their fourth step in. And often they say to me, but I've got one. And I say, watch my lips very carefully. Or they say, I've got a yellow legal tablet. I say, it won't work. 
And they said, why? And I said, because it's your idea. <laughs> Now, I was, I was thinking about this emotionally involved thing the other day, you know, I just want to throw this in, right in the middle of the fourth step, about emotional involvement. People, I don't know what the, I don't know what the guidelines are here in, in, in Grant's Pass, how long you shouldn't be emotionally involved for. But what a stupid thing to say to an alcoholic. I, I'm emotionally involved with my green spiral bound notebooks. I'm emotionally involved with ashtrays. I mean, for God's sake, you tell an alcoholic not to get emotionally involved. I'm emotionally involved. I'm emotional. Anyway, that will move along. Get to that in a minute. <laughs> and I get people, they write their mother's name and all this stuff and all the people, and we just move along. And it's incredible. But, you see, I couldn't do it that way to start with. And I want to share with you my four steps. Not all the details, but I'll tell you the worst parts. Because that's how it works best, right? The first time I'm sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I look up at the thing, the steps on the wall, and, and I know that I can't join Alcoholics Anonymous because I've never done anything immoral. I, I had 135 felonies when I was in that penitentiary, but I could not see immorality. And, and I am worried that you will not accept me in Alcoholics Anonymous unless I can write down something immoral, show it to the group secretary, and get, get to be a member. And I, I didn't pray because I didn't believe in God at the time, so I just had thoughtful meditation, and then I remembered. I used to give bad checks to hookers. <laughs> and you may laugh, but I, my membership of Alcoholics Anonymous depends on kiting hookers. Because that, I mean, I said to myself, that's it. I'm immoral enough to join this crowd. And a little bit later, I, I took a fourth step on a three-by-five card. <laughs> and uh, I haven't had a drink since. I... I I took it out of the 12 by 12, you know, those seven deadly sins and the gr greed, pride, lust, all that stuff. And, and the people down the side, and I put cross-reference and put little check marks. And I haven't taken a drink since. That's 24 years ago I did that. And, and then I tore it up in case anybody cracked the code and found out about my life. <laughs> and then I wrote the great British novel. <laughs> Some of you have been writing the American novel. I know that one. It's like ours, only ours is better written. <laughs> and I haven't taken a drink since. And when I was three years sober, a man called Sam came to me, and he was two years sober, and he said, Ben, I'm going to drink tomorrow. What can we do about it? And I said, Sam, you better take a fourth and fifth step, and I'll show you how. I picked up the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and I made Sam right. And he did his fourth and fifth step over that weekend. And as far as I know, Sam's still a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I haven't had a drink since. But the next day I lapsed into an alcoholic depression. Now if any of you are worried about depression, I want to share some things with you. I don't want to get into a Mexican pissing contest about whether your depression's worse than my depression. <laughs> but most of alcoholic depression comes from not getting our way. <laughs> it's fueled with self-pity. Most of my depressions come from two minutes of bad news and 23 hours and 58 minutes of replay. <laughs> replay. 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 And if you can pass the doctor's office and get to your sponsor, you'll live long enough to pass it on to other people that they don't last forever. Anyway, I had this depression Monday after showing Sam how to do the fourth and fifth step. And I'd forced him to do stuff that I hadn't been prepared to do. And I took this book out and I started to write. And on I got with it. I haven't had a drink since. 
I had taken some fifth steps prior to this, and that is what saved my life. I was very, very concerned that the right person heard my fifth step, and uh, because I had some real stuff in there. Oh, real stuff. Oh, dear. So I picked out this Catholic priest who was seven years sober, and I said to him, Donal, will you listen to my fifth step? And he said, yes. It was a Thursday night, January 1972. And he didn't say anything else. I didn't know what the next question was. You hadn't given me the script. I just, I asked him to listen to my fifth step. He said, yes, I walked away. Next Thursday, I said, Donald, when can we do this? He said, call me. He was very poor on second lines. <laughs> the next week, I got his telephone number. <laughs> This is January 1972. By Good Friday of 1972, he and I had got it together. <laughs> and I sat with Donal in a Catholic residence in Gloucestershire in England and spent ten hours pouring out this rubbish. Haven't had a drink since. Right in the middle of it, he said, this isn't a fifth step. Didn't like that. I didn't like what I heard, so I carried on talking. I didn't know what he meant until about five years later. I'm listening to a guy's fifth step, and I go, this isn't a fifth step. And I knew what I was talking about, because he hadn't done a fourth step beforehand either. Doesn't mean it's wrong. There are many times that I will ask somebody to tell me the worst things they've ever done. Let's get it out of the way so that you can live long enough to take the fourth step. Really. I have done a little bit of research in the last 25 years as to why people drink again. It has been very important to me because I have wanted to not fall into the pitfalls of the people who drink again. So anybody who has had a period of sobriety and has then drunk again, for years I would question them. And I would ask them why they did it. And that was the dumbest question I ever did ask. Because somebody who's come back off a drunk having been sober they're certifiably lunatic, and they have no idea what happened. So now I ask some different questions. I say, did you do the fourth step, like it says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? And I'm not talking about Hazelden, and I'm not talking about Father Larry's Guide. I'm talking about the fourth step, like it says in the big book. The one that says... <laughs> Five times on one page, you're going to die if you don't do it this way. We've got people saying you can do it any way you like. Watch their feet. The instructions here are absolutely perfect. And yet we've got that little thing. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to this. But we have to, I believe... Follow the perfect example. Then I would ask a question, if they had done the fourth step, I would say, did you do the sexual inventory like it says in the big book? There'll be people blushing in this room. Because I know. I know. I've 12 stepped someone who have not done this. There's a part in here on page 69 and 70 where it talks about the ideal sex life. Ideal, best possible solution. And alcoholics don't really believe they deserve that stuff. So close the book. <laughs> For God's sake, don't get into that. <laughs> don't get into that. Says ideal five times, must mean it. Must mean it. You know, I look around the room, I got about 15 ideals during the moment of silence. <laughs> I got to tell you that I, my morals are rather somewhere below that of an alley cat. Um, promiscuous is too technical for me. <laughs> Womanizer is too specific. It's bad. I've got to tell you, it's bad. But we need to share it. 
We need to share it so we can live. I do some once a year, there's a four step workshop down in San Mateo and I get to be the facilitator about once a year. It works for four week, in four week cycles. The third week, which is about sex, the audience drops by a half automatically. But not when I do it because I harass them so badly at the second week that they have to show up. <laughs> and it saves their lives. Step six. <laughs> I used to think that said shape up and praise God. It's the most misunderstood step in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I believe. It means we don't do nothing. Get out of the goddamn way. It's wonderful. I love what the big book says about it. If you're not willing to have God remove all these defects of character, pray. And then he doesn't say what happens if you're still not willing. Doesn't say pray again. Doesn't say, say call your sponsor. Just says, take the seventh step. It's a move along program. Now, I've instituted another step. I, it, I know that there are perfectionists, ideal purists here, but there is step 6A. <laughs> Without it, I do not believe we will last in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Step 6A says, sit and suffer sober. And if we're not willing to suffer long enough to get to the next period of comfort, we may have to go somewhere else. And we get lost on the way. So we got step six and seven and we move along. And I didn't have a lot of joy with step eight. I, I didn't like it. it. It seemed the sort of thing that I'd been advised against, writing down all these people I'd harmed. And uh, I killed a man in 1955, and, and I didn't remember it until I was a year sober. Alcohol is beautiful. It absorbed the memory of that man's death until I was a year sober. And I knew that I could never make amends to him, and so I kept him off the list. And then one day I knew I had to put him on the list. And I had to be willing to make amends to him. And through sponsorship, I, I sponsored a man who, who had run PCP up to the state of Oregon from Mexico. A lot of kids had died as a result. And he'd been, he was sober a few years when I started to sponsor him. He moved and, and he'd been sponsored by somebody who got him to write letters to the kids who died. And we don't know who they are. And I didn't know who this man was. I have never known his name. I just know that he died because of me. And, uh, and I sat outside a house one day that I was going to show a, to a real estate client. And, and I just wrote in my notebook, Dear Victim, this may very, be very small consolation to you. But because of your death, my guilt was so bad and it had to be covered up by alcohol for so long that you had a part in me getting sober and that because I'm sober there are some other people who've got sober and you had a part in that and I wrote love then and closed my notebook and I was done it was okay a lot of people will say there are in step nine that we can't make amends to all these people because we don't know where they are and I want to tell you about Larry Major. Larry Major was a steeplechase jockey back home in England, and he was a drinking buddy of mine. And he owned a bar, he'd retired from the racetrack, and, and he owned a bar, and I was in his bar one day, and we were going on to drink somewhere else. And I said, Larry, I need some money. And he said, well, I'll cash your check. And of course I had checks. <laughs> they weren't mine. But I wrote enough on the check and, and he opened the till and I took the money and put the check in and we went off and got drunk somewhere else. And when I was sober a couple of years, a, a horse won the Grand National by a friend of mine and I had a lot of money on it and 
I had started to make my first financial amends out of well-to-do's Grand National, and I sent money to Larry Major. And he'd drunk his way out of the pub and out of the county, and I didn't know where he was, and the letter came back. And It would have been easy if I'd been listening at the AA meetings to the majority who say, you made an effort, you've done enough. It was not enough. It's never enough. I know a lot of people in the world of horse racing and I kept asking where Larry Major was. And one day a man called Nimrod Wilkinson called me, another ex-jockey, and he said, this is Larry Major's telephone number. And I took a deep breath and I prayed and I said the serenity prayer because I didn't want to make this call. I mean, it was all right whilst I was looking for him, but now we've got to talk to him. <laughs> and I, I picked up the phone and I called a number in Liverpool in England and I said to Larry, this is Ben Wilson, how are you doing? And he said, hi Ben, how's it going? I said, about that money I owe you. And Larry said, what money? You see, it wasn't my check and he didn't know whose it was and he was in a blackout and he had no idea that I owed him money. And I sent him the money. Christmas morning this year, I was talking to Larry Major on the telephone, and he's 20 years sober. And uh, maybe that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't made amends to him a couple of years earlier. It took me 17 years to read the 10th step. You see, I, I miss words. I thought it said, if we were wrong, promptly admitted it. <laughs> Can't take the step. It says, when we were wrong. That means you and me are going to be wrong frequently. There is no disgrace in being wrong. I was brought up a lot of disgrace in being wrong. It changed me. I had a 10th step book for a long time and the last 10 years I haven't written as much as I did the preceding 10 years, but I, I had this 10th step book and I used to write what I was afraid of, who I resented, what I should have done that hadn't done and what I had not done that I should have done. I, I don't know whether I got that right, but you got the, you got the point. And, uh, and today I, I do it slightly differently. I, I talk to two or three guys very frequently. I share with them what's going on in my life. And, uh, and I move along to step 11. And uh, this last year, I got married. I got married. We got married. <laughs> this is a we program. You can't do an I program with marriage. Prudence and I got married on November the 21st last year. And uh, yeah, that's pretty good, isn't it? I am wearing a wedding ring for the first time in my life. I was against wedding rings. They ruin your sex life. We got married in Tahoe at Vista Point and we had these two boxes for the wedding rings after the ceremony. And I looked at Prudence, I said, what the hell are we going to do with these? I don't think we'll be needing them. It was like the cork out of the bottle. And from some 150 feet above Lake Tahoe, we lobbed them into the lake. And uh, they've gone to the bottom of Lake Tahoe because we don't need them. And uh, since we've been together, we've meditated together. My meditation has become more formalized. I, I don't know whether that's necessary or not. I don't know whether prayer is necessary or not. I, it's, you know... It's like anything else. It's like insurance, you know. You only need, the, need it the days you need it. And I never know what days they are. But we pray and meditate together every morning and most afternoons. And Last year I, I started back in construction one more time. I, one more construction company we started. And we were renovating a bar in the Bermuda Triangle in San Francisco, if any of you know that, the Balboa Cafe, we were doing the remodel and four construction workers are standing out there at seven o'clock in the morning holding hands saying the third step prayer. <laughs> Jesus Christ. 
You know, a, a hard-hearted, trained killer. <sighs> it's not right. <laughs> it's not appropriate, I'll tell you that. So that's what we do, and I'm going, I've got a few minutes to tell you about the 12th step, and uh, if you're new, get some 12th step experiences to share. I got 12 step stories I can go on for days and weeks. Edie shared some of them with you. I, I love those stories. I can drive around Sacramento and every apartment building I come to on the north side of Sacramento, I can tell you about a puking drunk in that apartment building. And uh, when I was there, the, I got a real estate license because my construction company was going down the tubes and I had a lot of houses to sell all of them mine. <laughs> I'm a high roller, you got the picture. <laughs> We're either up or down. and <laughs> Sometimes we don't know which it is. <laughs> and uh, I shared an office with a guy called Herb Long who couldn't get sober. And uh, Herb had been seven years around the program and he was seven days sober and I said to him, Herb, what we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of 12-step work because you need it. And I called central office and I said, every 12-step call for a man north of the river during the day comes to this office from now on. And we 12-stepped everybody, Herb and I, and we just went out. He's just celebrated, I think, 14 years of continuous sobriety. And uh, we went to bars, we went to apartment buildings. We didn't go into bars, we went to them. And I want to share this with you because... There are people who will make a decision not to go on a 12-step call because the man or woman is in a bar. I'm going to take the excuse away from you. This is what you say. You say, put down the drink. Stand outside the bar. I will pick you up. Okay? Real simple, three lines of script. Herb and I pull up outside the Hofbrau. They, they normally say, what car are you driving? I say, none of your goddamn business. If you're not standing there, I shan't slow down. Well, this guy got the instructions, but he got them a little bit wrong. It's 110 in the shade. It's midday, high noon in Sacramento, outside the Hofbrau. And this kid's sitting on a case of Budweiser. <laughs> but we picked him up anyway. <laughs> And I was speaking in Sacramento a couple of years ago and he drove 150 miles to come and tell me he was seven years sober. Seven years sober. And Herb had taken him home that night and Herb had taken him to the door and he said, that's where the liquor store is. That's the shortcut down the alley to the liquor store. But if you leave the house, don't come back. And that's how we treat drunks. Language they understand. I was going on the 12-step call. Another excuse I'm going to take away from you is that we don't take other people necessarily. They sent out a directive from the San Francisco Central Office that said thus. It said, do never go alone on a 12-step call. Well, this room empties out if we're responsible. That's our responsibility. If Bill had had to find somebody else to go with to find Bob, we're all dead. <laughs> they also said in this directive I just want you to know about how when AA gets organized how out of gear it can get it said that men 12 step men and women 12 step women now that may be a good idea and you may think it's right but I am going to continue it says gay men 12 step gay women and gay women 12 step gay men and condemned bisexuals to die. Because nobody can go and 12 step them, can they? <laughs> and whilst we're talking about it, I sponsor a few gay guys and a few straight guys. And on the cold night of the soul, we get down to cases and conditions. And uh, I've listened to four or five hundred fifth steps in the last 25 years. And Nobody who's straight has failed to do something gay, and nobody who's gay has failed to do something straight. <laughs> Makes us all weird, doesn't it? 
Now I know that some of you are weirder than me, <laughs> and I am here to attest that I am weirder than some of you. <laughs> but none of us are absolute, and the labels will kill us. The labels kill us. And they get in the way of our 12-step work. Anyway, Folsom, California, we're getting close to the end. <laughs> I got a call and I'm going on my own because at that time I was headed for the 12th Step Hall of Fame <laughs> and you get credit for those you get twice the credit if you go alone you see <laughs> if you're new don't worry about it it's an inside joke the 12th Step Hall of Fame somewhere on the outskirts of Akron, Ohio but it hasn't been built yet Anyway, I'm on my way to 12 Step, this guy, and uh, I drive past the Folsom meeting. It's Wednesday evening. They're just coming out. I can't go past without picking up a couple of these guys to go on the 12 Step call. A guy called Dennis Haney, Whitey, and Bobby Burton come out of the meeting together. I pull into the parking lot. I say, get the car. By the way, that is the first step in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Get the car. <laughs> So they jump in the car, we go off to this drunk, and he is very drunk. He didn't hear a word we said, so we had a little meeting. Three ten-minute pitches, thirty-minute meeting, up, gone. We're standing in the hallway, and he just comes to enough to say, you're good people. And I said, yeah, we're good people. We beat the fire brigade. He said, no, you're good people, because the dog didn't bite you. <laughs> I looked down, there's this dachshund, you know, three dogs long, half a dog high, <laughs> and it's licking Whitey's hand. Now, evidently, this is a very savage dog that has to be locked in the garage when they have visitors. They probably hadn't had too many visitors, the way the host drank, but the dog knew we were about our father's business. And he's licking Whitey's hand. Now, this is a stupid story. Most of my stories are stupid. But because Ed knew that we were good people, he's standing on his porch the following night at 7.30 when I come by to pick him up to take him to his first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And about five years ago, Whitey meets him in Carson City, California, at Carson City, Nevada, and he's 10 years sober because the dog didn't bite us. <laughs> now, this is important stuff. <laughs> now, I've got another dog story I want to share with you. <laughs> a couple of them, actually. <laughs> I had this lower power. He's a little blonde cocker spaniel, and <laughs> Phil knows him. And uh, he died a couple of years ago at Christmas. Uh, Christmas Day, he had a heart attack. There were 45 AAs in the house, and Angus was amongst his friends and had a heart attack, and we had to put him down the next day. But um, One day, the, we get a call, and I'm out, and the dog answered it. I mean, this is strange. He just knocked the telephone off, and John's one day sober, and Angus is barking at the telephone, and John's saying, hello, hello, and Angus is barking at him, and with his first call for help after he got telephone numbers in Alcoholics Anonymous at the meeting the night before. John Nolan's 15 years sober. It works. I finally wrote the letter to my dad that told him how much I hated him. I was 22 years sober. I had made amends to him. I had told him about the corporate dividend checks that I'd stolen off the front mat and cashed in the pub. I told him what I'd done. I made amends to him, and I still hated him. <laughs> and I wrote him that letter, sat down at my computer one day, and I wrote a five-page letter. And thank God for the old-timers in Alcoholics Anonymous who told me never to mail the letters until I'd read them to somebody. And I read it to this woman, Gwen, who I was arrested with that night. And uh, she just celebrated 20 years of continuous sobriety. Uh, she wasn't an alcoholic when I got sober, of course. 
But uh, thank God for her wisdom. And she shared with me, she said, for every point of view, there is another point of view. Why don't you write to your dad and ask him what his point of view was? Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.